Hey, welcome to Next Level Method Podcast. I'm Richard Ryerson. And I'm Matt Lilly. And we're here to help you take your life to the next level. Let's get started. Well, Matt, I was excited to have David on the show, man. This is, I'm excited for people to watch this one. Yeah, no, it, he's just an incredible resource. And, you know, uh, he told me the story originally behind how he kind of got to this three vital questions and the empowerment dynamic. And it literally, he just kind of sat in meditation and asked the question, what's the opposite of drama? Yeah. A- and this all kind of came to him the next day, actually, or in his dream and then and then the next day. But, you know, I- I've been around this stuff, like I said, for over a decade. And it's just, it, it continually unfolds. It's not like one of those things you go to or yeah. you listen or you read. Right. And it's like, and then... Uh, you know, 30 minutes later, a day later, it's, it's like in and out. It's like once you are exposed to, you know, the, the dreaded drama triangle, the empowerment dynamic, and the three vital questions, it's like it just shifts your brain. It right? really does. Yeah. I mean, it shifted mine totally. I mean, I, I know I've shared that story with yeah. you offline about, how, you know, again, I've read hundreds of books over the last right. eight years for, right. the, for the show and doing podcasts and stuff. This one really... I still find myself using on a day-to-day basis. Because it's just so fundamental. I think you mentioned this in the show uh, when people listen, but it's just so fundamental human nature. It's like we all play these roles. We do. We just are playing them unconsciously. And once you can identify, see them, then you can actually shift shift your thinking. At least, if nothing else, it just gives you pause so that I, I used to call it like the seven seconds, like on TV where you, you know, the seven seconds where they bleep out just in case somebody says something wrong, yeah, right? right. I mean, it's kind of that seven second delay where, now at least I can go, oh, here's the role I'm about ready to step into. Is this really what I want? Right. right. And that right. saves me arguments. It saves me heartache. It saves me a lot. <laughs> right. So, yeah, no, it, he's, again, just uh, David's just an incredible uh, resource and, and great stuff. When, we were, when you were setting out designing Next Level Method, yeah. how much, I mean, obviously, I know when you exposed me to yeah. Next Level yeah, Method, yeah, I'm like, this is why I love it so much. Yeah. Because Three yes. Vital Questions is so wrapped up in this, right. you know. Mm-hmm. It, it, how much of it do you think is foundational to Next Level Method? A, a ton of it, especially in my thinking about just the human condition, human nature, what what makes us uh, feel like we're failing and what makes us feel like we're succeeding in life. And so, you know, because it's had, again, I've had over a decade of exposure to his work, it, it just really played into a lot of the basis of, yeah. of the thought because it changes the psychology of how we think. And of course, you know, uh, as David said in the podcast, uh, it's it's a, it's an ongoing thing. It's, you're never going to get 100% right, right? You're, right. You're, you're, we have off days, and that's okay. It, you know, the nice thing about this is it's okay. You can forgive yourself for having the off day, and you can get back on track. Right. Where before I may have, like, had an off day, and that turned into an off week, which turned into an off month, because I'm so punishing myself for making the wrong decision or making the wrong choice or saying the wrong thing. And now it's like, well, no, I was just playing that role. Yeah. And now I just need to go apologize, own up to it, and then focus back on what do I want, right? What yeah. I want in this relationship, what do I want out of, out of life. So, so yes, back to Next Level Method, that's a lot of his work was a very influenced what yeah. we do at Next Level Method for well, sure. I mean, I know that's what really turned the light bulb on for me and, and, right. and, and got me bought into this, this whole process. And, mm-hmm. and it's so great. I'm excited for people to, to learn more about David and Next Level Method. Yeah. So let's make sure... Go check out uh, nextlevelmethod.com to learn more about this, and uh, let's get you on with this great conversation with David Emerald, uh, the author of Three Vital Question and the author of The Empowerment Dynamic yeah. here on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for hosting us today, Richard. Yeah, this has been bet. awesome. Thanks. Well, David Emerald, on the show. Welcome, my friend. So nice to meet you. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with both of you. You know, I got to tell you, this book, Three Vital Questions, has been a game changer for me personally. And I know that we, I was giving you kind of the backstory then the pre-recording about how I came across this just in this year, in February, and really started diving into it. And what's funny is I'm finding myself on a daily basis, catching myself in conversations with my spouse, with my kids, seeing myself react, you know, catching myself, a lot of times it's after the fact, you know, I've reacted in yeah. the drama cycle. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm like, yeah. how could I have done me that? Too. Yeah, right. Too. <laughs> you know, and what I really appreciate that about this, Dave, and we can dive in, and I, I want to really deep dive into these three vital questions, but the thing that I really f- was kind of the aha moment for me and was really kind of a relief, if you will, like almost kind of like a burden's been lift off, lifted off my shoulders of realizing that this is our natural state as human beings to be in this drama state. And when I really started to absorb that, it was, I was like, oh, okay, you mean we're all, okay, so I know I need to... St- I can stop beating myself up or I can be more forgiving to myself now that I'm in this drama triangle. So I don't know. What, how do you, what do you think when you hear me say that? Well, what I think is that it is the, it is the default way of being, as I say, um, for us as human beings. And it has served a real purpose for us 
frankly, as a species and helping us survive. Right. Um, and what I would contend is that it also has reached the, the end of its usefulness for us and that that there really is a call for an upgrade in what I call the human operating system. Uh, and yet at the same time, it is important to realize that that drama and uh, and focusing on problems will we'll get into the, the questions themselves is our default way. So it takes conscious reflection, con conscious effort in order to um, to break the habits that we have because of that. Uh, to what to me is not hardwiring, but it is deep wiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, I was uh, came into contact with this work about a decade, a little over a decade ago, um, when you uh, you had written your first book, or I shouldn't say your first book, the book that I read, uh, the Empowerment Dynamic, Ted. And I remember seeing this for the first time. I was in Dallas. I was at a leadership conference, and I was w watching this in a PowerPoint, and a gentleman was presenting it. And I just I started looking at. It, I was like. This basically explains about 99% of how I've reacted in my life. I like <laughs> right. literally I did. That's so true. I was, I was watching. I was like, no wonder things have like, I had just thought back to every relationship that had, you know, gone sour or every business deal that kind of went sideways right. or just almost anything. I just looked at that and I went, this is the human condition. Right. And then when I saw, you know, the empowerment dynamic on the other side of the drama triangle, I was like, and there's, and, and then you start to see even in, in that, oh, there are times that I've showed up this way, these, these other roles. But I was just right. like, wow, if, you know, how much, t how much time have I wasted? How much time have, ha have I uh, just kind of went around bumping my head against the wall when there was another way of being? And I had to forgive myself for just being basically ignorant, right? right. I mean, you just don't know what you don't know. Yeah, how you describe that, well, that was exactly the way that I kind of felt that that mm -hmm. was that burden that was being lifted or kind of the light bulb that came on. I'm sorry, yeah. David, go ahead. What were you going to say? Well, no, that's, uh, and, and I think it's important to, um, to give the appropriate attribution that the, the actual drama triangle was created by uh, Dr. Stephen Cartman. Mm -hmm. And um, and he gave me permission, if you will, to uh, call it the dreaded drama triangle, the PDT, <laughs> because of the, the toxic nature of the roles and dynamics that, um, that emerge uh, when we are in drama. I guess for the sake of the listeners, so, I mean, the three of us yeah. are obviously familiar right. with the dreaded drama triangle, that natural condition. What is the best way to kind of explain somebody, David, that's not familiar with your material? You know, what's a good starting point for them for, so, so that we can kind of deep dive in the rest of this podcast? What's a good starting point to kind of let the yeah. listener know what we're talking about here? Well, I think, um, I think what would be the best way to approach it from, and it's the way I, I, I do approach it, is through the three vital questions. So, how about if I give a real high level, uh, uh, we'll walk through the three vital questions and then we can dive as deep as you want to into each one of them. Yeah. Uh, but the first, the first of the three vital questions is where are you putting your focus? And are you focusing on problems or are you focusing on outcomes? And that gets into to our mindsets or what I call the, the human operating system. And then the second vital question is how are you relating? How are you relating to others? How are you relating to your experience? Frankly, how are you relating to yourself? And are you relating in ways that produce or perpetuate drama, as we've been talking about? Or are He's still recording on that. <clears throat> Just so you know, he's still recording on his end. Mm -hmm. Then the third vital question is, what actions are you taking? And are you merely reacting to the problems of the moment? Or are you taking generative and creative action, including the solving of problems in service to outcomes? So our mindsets really create the conditions in which our relationship uh, roles and dynamics play out. And then of course, it's about eventually taking action. And um, so that those are the three vital questions themselves. I think that's a kind of a quick overview of what we're gonna be talking about or yeah. what we are talking about. Yeah, David, I think one thing that I love about or what I want to explore in the, in the first vital question, is that mindset, the difference between kind of this problem orientation or this victim mm -hmm. orientation versus this outcome-based mindset. You know, I, that's huge, right? And when we're talking about, I know for me as being a leadership junkie and even in life, I mean, when you, when you think of the outcome, that gives you the, the emotional rocket fuel to continue on and in hard times. But so talk a little bit about that, the difference between this problem mindset and an outcome-based mindset. Yeah, so the the uh, the organizing principle that um, that 
I use around the mindset is what I call FISB. And FISB just stands for uh, focus, interstate, and behavior. So what we focus on engages some sort of emotional response, with, which then drives behavior. So in the problem orientation, our focus is on problems. A problem comes into our experience, and it engages an interstate that is some form or flavor, if you will, of anxiety. And and frankly, it's almost always fear-based anxiety, although it can be as mild as I wish this would go away and it's a hassle to out and out fear and terror. But that interstate of fear-based anxiety then drives reactive behavior. And there's really four basic forms of the reactive behavior. It's either fight, 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 flight, freeze, or appease. Um, meaning we either react aggressively or we try to get away from it or we do nothing and hope it goes away. Or one that I've added over the years is that I may go along to get along, um, appease. And again, to me, that that is the uh, that is our default orientation as human beings. That's how most of us, uh, including myself, operate if I'm not staying aware, not staying conscious. And yet, we all have experience with the upgrade to what I do call the outcome orientation or the outcome mindset where our focus is on an outcome, which may be really clear and concrete. It may be more kind of vague and directional. And if we care about that outcome, and, and that, that really is the essential quality of caring, it taps into a more of a passion-based inner state that then gives us the energy to take what I call baby steps, take whatever the next baby step is that's going to uh, help us get closer to and or clearer about that outcome. And, um, and that's kind of the upgrade that I'm talking about is, is that um, you know, don't want to sound too flowery here, but I think as uh, that humanity really is in need of an upgrade to a more conscious outcome focused orientation. That's why I said I think the problem orientation has taken us about as far as it can. Yeah, I agree. And, and again, it goes back to what you said about that's how we're wired as human beings. That's how we survived as a species, right? The mm -hmm. fight, yeah. flight, uh, appease or, Fre and or freeze. freeze. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, yep. that's what happened when a saber-toothed tiger presented itself around the corner, right? I mean, those, gotcha. those were our options. And so now, because we start using this, instead of the alligator brain, this front side, right? Exactly. right? Yeah, that the cortex. we have the power and the ability to be intentional about being aware of that, right? And to me, that's this right. book really is, or everything you're talking about here, is such a, it's, a, it's totally a self-awareness book. And self-awareness... I, for me, from studying mm -hmm. leadership, and I mean, I didn't even, when I f first got into leadership and everything else, I didn't realize how important self-awareness was, right? Mm -hmm. And even right. like to your point, I guess where I'm going with this, the problems, where I thought I was mm -hmm. solving problems, I wasn't solving problems. I was reacting to the anxiety and trying to right. get away from it. And then when I stopped being less or became less anxious, mm -hmm. binging Netflix, playing video games, mowing the yard, doing something right. Right. that took me away from it that I thought the problem was going away, but really I was just getting away from the anxiety and that's where we get this mm -hmm. roller coaster. Yeah, what I call the roller coaster. And a couple, couple points I just really want to uh, uh, call out from what you're sharing there, Richard, is that, that first of all, we rarely, if ever, sustainably solve problems from a problem oriented. That's right. right. And what's really important for people to, to, to reflect on or to get is that what drives this operating system is our anxiety. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we do something that lessens the intensity of the problem that we're reacting to, our anxiety goes down and so we lose energy for action. And so um, as, as one of our certified trainers said one time, he said, you know, not only is this not a problem solving orientation, it's really an anxiety management system. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. You know, I I found that distinction uh, here a couple of months ago. I was work. I was actually had read the book. I was working with some of the material um, uh, with David's team, and you know, I, I w there was a cash flow issue at a business that I'm involved in, and I was just kept focusing on I got to I got to get this cash flow issue got to fix. I got to get it. and I was and in my mind, even I knew some of the work. I'd read read the book, and 
in my mind, I was like, oh, no, I'm working on the outcome. I'm fixing cash flow. Mm -hmm. But no, I wasn't. I was still focused on the problem, which was the cash flow was the problem. But I was still focused on that. And, and finally, it kind of one day it kind of clicked. And I was like, wait a second. I'm still focused on the problem. What do I actually want? Right. What, yeah. what, what, what's my outcome? And my outcome was much different than fixing cash flow. My outcome was I want my customers to be happy. I want to be able to provide world class service. I want to, you know, and, and as I started listening to those things, it opened up a different part of my mind, that creator part of my mind. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it was like, well, gosh, we could do this. We could do this. And lo and behold, if we do those things, guess what happens? Cash flow improves, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Cash flow yeah. improves. So it was just, it was just, but for weeks I was just stuck in that problem mindset and creating anxiety up late at night, waking up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, how am I ever going to fix, you know, fix, fix, fix versus what, what's the, what's the outcome here for me? Yeah. 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 So, so powerful what you said there, Matt, too, mm -hmm. because it's almost like, like your first kind of stab at getting rid of that was still just kind of wanting the problem to go, go away. away. <laughs> and, that's, yes. and that's not an appropriate <laughs> right. response. Wasn't doing anything. But it was still do, creating. Right. Yeah. And doing the work of like, well, what does this look like? It's kind mm -hmm. of like the simple example that I've, I can't remember where I heard this. Maybe it was, anyway, it was through your stuff, David. Maybe it was in the course. It's like losing weight. It's like if I want to lose 10 pounds, Everybody wants to lose weight. Well, then you say, well, I just, I'm going to lose 10 pounds. Well, even that's not enough. Well, I want to lose a pound a week. Well, even that's not enough. But when you start getting what does a healthy lifestyle look like? Mm -hmm. Right. What is the outcome I'm trying to achieve? And you start to imprint that. In your, and that takes a lot of work. I don't think people fully appreciate how difficult that is. It's easy for me to say what mm -hmm. I don't want. I could list right. that all day long. But to really exactly. sit there and say this is the outcome I want takes a lot of work, Right. It, 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 it takes work and what it really takes is the ability to pause and yeah. to, to make the shift of focus. And uh, Matt, your example is great. And, and Richard, you're right. The, the, what you're referring to is uh, my wife Donna's um, shift from I want to lose 20 pounds again to finally getting what she really wanted uh, and what she really is still living into is optimal health as I age. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's it's amazing some of the uh, what I really loved about what you said, Matt, is that how your behaviors and what you did shifted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just like, you know, back to Donna's uh, optimal health, as she started taking action toward that, the pounds came off. Right. That was not the that right. was not what she was going after. She was going after optimal health. Mm -hmm. Well, because that vision of what you doing that work there and the same with your wife. David, it gives you fuel, mm -hmm. passion. Yeah. I call it rocket mm -hmm. fuel to, Energy, to, to yeah. sustain you. Because if you have that in your mind, then if cash flow isn't mm -hmm. what you expect it to be as you're going down this, you don't get discouraged right. or you don't give up. Right. Or, you're, or, you're, or if you don't lose a pound a week, you're like, oh, wait a second. Okay. Mm -hmm. you, can, you have the, the energy for the sustainability in the dark periods. That's the power yeah. behind this, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it is, and you know, one of the one of the key concepts, which is uh, really bound up in the third vital question, which uh, uh, hopefully we we'll have time to, to mm -hmm. get to. But it's this idea of baby steps, yep. because as you take a baby step, um, even if it's a step back, even if it's a mistake, even if it, it, it's uh, that baby step allows you to step back and say, okay, that didn't work. What does it tell me about what my next baby step might be? And so it does give you the rocket fuel to uh, to learn, adjust, and um, and that's how we uh, frankly create outcomes. Is you know it really is a baby step at a time. Yeah, I like to a couple of analogies. I, I like the analogies of slaying dragons. And when you're talking about an outcome based mindset, before I truly understood this or embraced this, I would say. I would go through life full of anxiety, wondering why there's so many dragons around me. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would yeah, try definitely. to create processes and, mm -hmm. and read books and do things to, to live a dragon-free world. And I thought that was the goal. Mm -hmm. well, the reality mm -hmm. is that you're, oh, there's always, the professional know there's always going to be dragons. That's right. And so the outcome-based mindset says, and harnessing the anxiety in the third step, which we'll get to, is like, which dragon? There's always going to be a dragon. I don't want to deal with dragons, but I'm going to pick which dragon, right? I'm in yeah. a room full of dragons. I want to pick the dragon that's sitting on the gold, right? And absolutely. And what, what I would, what I would also say is to ask yourself as you, as you focus on a dragon, 
if that dragon didn't exist or if I were able to slay it right now, what would it allow me to have, do, or be? Because by answering that question, you're actually shifting your focus to your outcome. And why in the world do you even care about that dragon? You know, that's a great point. What you just said right there, David, is probably key when people, because we talked about the difficulty of kind of defining what you want, that question right there can unlock, I think, the creativity to, to kind of start defining that outcome. I love that you well, said that. Well, I would that. say that's what Matt did with the uh, yeah. uh, shifting from the uh, problem of cash flow to wanting your customers to be happy. Mm-hmm. Yep, definitely. And and, and it, it literally, I mean, how we addressed everything from that point forward has shifted and is still shifting to, you know, how is this best, how, how is the customer service experience mm-hmm. the best it can possibly be? And when I, I think that is really just, do people feel connected? Do they feel loved? Do they feel a part of something, right? That's when All I right. say customer service. It's not like, you know, making sure we say th- please and thank you. It's more yeah. real than that, right? It, it's like yeah. I, want an, I yeah. want an authentic experience so that when people walk through our doors, they feel good. Uh, they feel good. They feel connected. They feel supported. They, it's like an energy center, right? So when they come yeah. in, they, they feel maybe whatever way they're feeling. And when they leave, they feel energized. They feel like, oh, I can go back out in life and, and I can slay dragons or I can do whatever I need to do to – in the world because I'm recharged. Yeah. Well, and, and what you do, uh, Matt, is you slay the dragons that are standing in the way of all the wonderful things that you just that's gave right. voice to. Right. You're not slaying and, a dragon that's keeping you away from or side getting right. you sidetracked, right? right. right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and if I can, what, what I would say is that um, eventually in this work, we reframe the problem orientation or the problem mindset to what I actually call a victim orientation because we feel victimized by all those dragons. We feel victimized by the problems that are keeping us up at night. And really the outcome orientation is a creator orientation. Right. It's about envisioning what it is that we really want. What is it we want to create? And, and Matt, you just gave great voice to the a very important question, which is if you had your outcome, how would you know it? And you just described it mm-hmm. right. in terms of, uh, the, the qualities and characteristics that would define that outcome. And if our operating system is this problem-focused victim orientation, it then creates the conditions for drama, which takes us into that second vital question of how are you relating? And um, again, for the listeners that may not be familiar with the drama triangle, uh, or the, the dreaded drama triangle, the primary role or the central role is the role of victim. And in order to be a victim, one must have a persecutor, must have a dragon. Uh, and that, that persecutor could be a person, it could be a condition, a health condition, COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be a situation like a natural disaster. And then the, the third role that completes the triangle is the role of rescuer. And um, And the rescuer is either trying to fix the victim or to protect the victim or take care of the victim. But the the drama triangle ping pongs around through these roles of victim, persecutor, rescuer. And all of those roles are problem focused and reactive in nature. Yeah. One thing I think it's important about, particularly in this, this, when we're talking about this dreaded drama triangle, is kind of the differentiation between victimization or being victimized. And we're, and I think it's important to point out that we're all victims of something. A, how, a tornado wipes out my house. Sure. I've been victimized by that natural event. But the, what we want to avoid is the victimization of that. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, and, and actually, um, I'm going to be real precise on language here because it's the, the distinction or the victimhood. victimization and victimhood. Victimhood, sorry. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I meant. Oh, well, that's yeah. right. And, and, and whereas, you know, you just described victimization really well and, and I said I wasn't going to uh, uh, point this out, but I am. But, you know, do I feel victimized by my broken wrist? <laughs> <Right>. Absolutely. <laughs> um, now, am I sitting around wallowing uh, and uh, and really identify, oh, why does this always happen to me? And woe is me. And, uh, and victimhood is about taking on as an identity or a way of being. And this work acknowledges, as you just did, Richard, that victimization happens. And... What, we're, what this work does is it really challenges or is a challenger to victimhood. Yeah. A way of being. And I think, you know, pointing out, if, and what I love about kind of the, I love visuals and kind of symbology behind things mm-hmm. and how the, the dreaded drama triangle, if you look at it, it's an upside down pyramid, you know, and that victim 
in which, again, when we're in this problem orientation, realizing that we're responding to anxiety, it's easy for us to feel as a victim, and it's at the bottom, and it's unstable, right? And exactly. I love that visual of that. What do you, and, yeah. and so how do we get... I guess I don't, maybe this is a good point to talk about the antidotes. Like how do we shift from yeah. victim to, to creator and, and so forth? So let's talk yeah, about well, that. Well, we'll get to that question. Um, but I do want to tee up the, the empowerment dynamic or what we lovingly mm-hmm. call TED, which is the antidote to the toxic right. DDT uh, relationship roles and dynamics. And in order to develop our capability to really show up um, in that dynamic, it does require a shift of mindset. It requires a shift. So we go back to that first vital question and really um, adopting a creator outcome focused orientation. And out of that mindset and out of that orientation, the antidote roles uh, of TED, the primary role shifts from victim to creator. And as a creator, we we can envision outcomes as, as Matt, uh, so ably uh, illustrated a few minutes ago, and we choose our response to whatever happens to us, including when we feel victimized. And so rather than reacting to the dragon, I'm gonna keep using that mm-hmm. analogy, but rather than reacting reacting to the dragon as a persecutor, as a creator, I can see it as a challenger. So challenger is the antidote to the role of persecutor and challengers are those people conditioned situations that show up in our life that call forth learning and growth. And, um, and we can be challengers to one another in conscious and constructive ways. And there are challengers like the tornado or whatever that, that can show up in our lives that, um, that, that have uh, lessons for us to learn. Uh, and then the antidote, the helping role in the empowerment dynamic is the role of coach. And coach is the antidote to the role of rescuer and the coach is not necessarily a professional coach. It's really anybody in our lives that will help us um, by asking us questions and leaves the power with us as a creator to think about what, what it is that I wanna create or how I choose to respond to current conditions or what my committed baby steps are. So the, the antidote roles that make up the empowerment dynamic are creator, challenger, and coach. What I love about all of that, there's so much stuff to unpack. My, mm-hmm. my mind is just like <laughs> racing yeah. of all the things. But I think a, a, some huge takeaways when I, when I was going through this material in this section. In the beginning, I, you know, again, maybe it's the kind of analytical mindset or the kind of the logical computer science brain of me that says, okay, great, now I have all these tools. And, okay, I've identified that I'm a victim, and now i got to do, you know, But then as you start diving deep, this isn't a, if X happens, then Y, right? It's not, it's so dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think two points is that to me, what's powerful about this is that we're always at a choice that no one, no matter what happens. And I love how you quoted Viktor Frankl. I mean, I love Mm -hmm. that. I mean, in this section, no one can take away your, how you choose to respond to this situation. That is at the heart of becoming a creator. And even if you don't know what to do next, and I think a lot of people, and I remember no when I was talking to people about this, they're like, okay, if, if I see that Matt's being a victim, then I need to do that. No, 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 no. I can't get somebody else to shift. And that's the other part of it that I want to, I can't right. get Matt to shift. Matt can't get me to shift. But I can choose how I respond to mm-hmm. what's happening between me and Matt in this situation or if the tornado mm-hmm. knocks out my house. That, to me, is the secret sauce. If you can always, no matter what's happening, remind yourself to get to that remind yourself that you're always at a choice and nobody right. or no thing can take that away from you. Right. I think that is, that is power. I don't know what do you guys think about that when you, when you hear me say that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, you have a thought on that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's the crux of life, right? I mean, we, we, we don't get to choose what happens to us, but we do get to choose how we respond to it. Exactly. As you said, in Victor Frankl's book, I mean, that's what he talked about, right? Being in his situation in Nazi concentration camp where he was at his position, he was stripped of everything except he could maintain his right to choose how he was going to respond and react and how he processed what he was, what was happening to him. And, and I mean, I think at a very, obviously in those circumstances at a very core level, you, you see how powerful it was. He survived when many didn't just because he made a different choice um, in his head. And even if he hadn't survived, he still was living a different experience than those around him. Right. 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 That's right. That's right. Absolutely. 
And and the reality is that victims um, relinquish that uh, that um, ability to choose, mm -hmm. or they can assume that they don't have a choice. And so you're absolutely right, Richard, that that, that we are always a choice. Maybe a very narrow, like Victor Frankl, right, right. very narrow um, range of choices. And golly, in our in our culture, in our society, uh, there may be all kinds of choices that are available to us. Right. Yeah, and particularly when in those, you know, it's the most empowering thing that you have. Even if it, if it is, there's not a lot of options, at least you still have that power. And maybe that gives you enough juice to sustain another day. Right. right. And, yeah. and, and I think, you know, when I've looked at this work and stuff, I've, I've kind of looked at it from the standpoint of power, right? Am I, am I giving my power away? Because if I'm giving my power away, if I'm letting others make choices for me, then, then I'm disempowering myself. So it's mm -hmm. a, ultimately a struggle for power. And especially when you're in the dreaded drama triangle, there's almost like it's a fight for power is the way I've kind of viewed it. Because, you know, between right. the persecutor and the rescuer and the victim, everybody's struggling <laughs> to control everybody else and control the situation. It's a struggle for power. Once you shift over to the empowerment dynamic, uh, now it's about empowering each other, right? It's about giving power. And, and it's not when, when you're giving power, it's not that you're giving your energy away. It's you're empowering others, lifting them up, right? right? It's a lifting up, not a tearing down. Um, and so it's just a different, it's, it's a shift. And it does, to your point, uh, take practice, right? Richard? Well, it's, it, yeah. it's, it's not a, it's not a it, you know, no matter how old you are, you built some habits. We got to unlearn <laughs> those habits and build some new habits. But just continuing to be diligent about that, right? And right. and when we and when we screw up or when we I, like I say mm -hmm. fall down and skin yeah. our knee, you just apologize and own it and then lean back in, right? Right. Yeah. It, yeah. As you're saying. Well, and, and oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go well, ahead. I just want I just want to uh, build on what you're saying, Matt. And um, I guess first and foremost, because I always feel the need to say this, mm -hmm. just because I teach this stuff and and try every day to live right. it. Don't think I've got it nailed. Right. And yeah. so um, it really is a lifelong journey. And, you know, one of the things I often say is that, you know, if, if the journey is a, a ratio of two steps up to one step back, you're making progress. That's what baby steps is all about. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it is important to, to realize that, that, it, that we are going to skin our knees, mm -hmm. that we are going to break our wrists, that we are, those things are going to happen. And we are a choice. Yeah, and I would I would say that that sometimes some magical things happen, and um, so I just, I'm going to share something that happened to me this week um, that uh, to me was magical, and it has to do with my broken wrist. And uh, and uh, yesterday, this was just happened yesterday. Uh, I was sitting in my easy chair and feeling victimized by, you know, the the uh, the the accident which happened when I was playing pickleball, which I just started playing, uh, which is a really fun game. And one of the reasons why I uh, decided to take up pickleball is that I wanted to connect with the community of people that love the game and that play the game. And part of my, uh, for a few moments, wallowing in my victimization, uh, I thought, well, what, you know, what is it that I really want, which was to be part of that community? And I, and this is a bit of an outcome wondering or statement. It's like, I wonder if there is a way that I could continue to be connected to the community, even though I'm not going to be able to play this summer. Within an hour after having that thought, I'm shifting my focus to the outcome of finding a way to stay con mm -hmm. connected. I got a group email uh, about looking for people who would uh, be willing to be trained as pickleball referees. <laughs> nice. And so now I'm going to be a pickleball referee. Nice. But I'm convinced that it was about mm -hmm. shifting my focus to the to an outcome, which was to be connected to the community, that somehow magically, uh, spiritually, however you want to language it, mm -hmm. I think opened the the pathway for uh, that opportunity to uh, to emerge. I love so it. So some magical things can happen. Can I share with you guys a story where that ha yeah. a month ago right? I saw 3VQ sure. in action on a, per a personal front. It wasn't with business, but it was with, with mm -hmm. home life, right? Mm -hmm. And I think me and my wife were – my wife or my third child just kid just graduated high school. She's 18, right? And she's had this boyfriend for a long – they've been dating for a long time. They're pretty serious. But a lot of anxiety is happening at the end of graduation because he's going to a school that's a little bit farther away and all this kind of stuff and – what happens? Do we break up and this and that? Anyway, so my daughter came home early from going over to see 
Michael, her boyfriend. And we were on the porch, and she was crying. And mm. we're like, what happened? And I'm like, oh, you know, long story less long, that they were talking about breaking up, and she kind of unleashed on him and said some pretty hurtful things. The big thing that she threw out there, the kind of the nuclear bomb, was like, I deserve better. Ooh. She didn't really mean that. Mm. And so I'm watching this as a, and normally my daughter and wife have these conversations. I interject every now and then. So I was kind of watching more of this is what's happening. And what I saw from my wife was she sees her daughter who's being a victim. Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. wife swoops in it in the rescuer mode. and She's trying to solve my daughter's problem. Right. She sees my daughter's problem as something that needs to be fixed. fixed right. And that, I mean, that came to me as I'm watching this and I'm seeing my daughter recoil because mom's trying mom's to fix, trying to fix. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting there normally now, if this was a year ago, I'd like, I got to go mow the backyard. Right? <laughs> <laughs> because this is too much for me to handle. Right. Flea. That was a flea response. <laughs> That's <Yes>. right. <laughs> so I stopped and I just asked a question and I said, well, what, you know, what are you hoping to achieve? So I just started asking questions to my daughter. Like, well, why do you think he said that? I mean, what, what are you hoping? Where do you think that came from? And eventually what came out is that she says, you know, I don't know why I said it. And, you know, eventually what came out, she says, like, you know, she just basically said it because she's afraid of what's happened. I said, right, it's all fear, right? You did that because of fear. And then separately, talking to my wife after my daughter was gone, I just said, started asking the question, how do you think? And, and long story, again, less long was that I got out of my wife was that, you know, maybe, I, maybe you should just, you know, listen more and ask. Don't look at her as a problem to be fixed. And my wife was like, yeah, you know, you're right. I just, just mm -hmm. listen to what she mm -hmm. has to mm -hmm. So anyway, that was kind of a, a victory for me where, like I said, literally, I know I would have, like, ah, I got to go clean the pool or go mow the yard. Right. Right? Yeah. yeah. And um, I want to connect your story to the, to the roles because you were seeing both your daughter and your wife as creators or holding that creator essence of, of them. And you operated from the coach role. Mm -hmm. And then um, in uh, a being a conscious, constructive, and loving challenger of your wife, uh, again, calling forth the learning from that experience about how she could approach uh, things that come up the next time they come up. Yeah. So you're, you were using those roles. Yep. Powerful yeah, stuff. It is very powerful. And obviously, personal relationships, it shows up the most, right? Usually, yeah. I mean... The drama triangle, yeah, the sure empowerment. I mean, that's, that's, you know, people we live with every day, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, ask how, how do you shift? And we could, we could do a whole podcast know, right? on just the, sure. the shift. But, um, so I'm, I'll, I'll give you to what to me is the essence of each of the, the shifts. And to me, the, the, the shift from victim to creator, which we've already uh, um, inherently talked about, is to shift from, what I don't want to what I do want. And to ask the question of what do I want or like you're with your daughter, you're asking her, what do you want or for as a team, you know, what is it we really want? And the answer to the, the question of what do we want cannot be just to solve the problem. Again, it's back to if we slayed the dragon, what would it allow us to have, do or be? And what is it that we really care about? The, the shift from uh, persecutor to challenger is uh, about what's here to be learned and um and that really uh, and and so the the essence is from uh persecutors put down or or want to be one up and the the notion of power that you're talking about Matt, of having power over right to um to one of power with others to power to create etc and then the the shift from rescuer to coach is really being able to to rather than seeing the person that you're wanting to support as a victim to be fixed or taken care of, which by the way, reinforces their powerlessness right. in the long run, which is probably why your daughter reacted the way she did. For sure. Uh, and uh, to really see the person that you're supporting as a creator in their own right, whether they're acting like it or not, or they know it or not. And to really move into that mode of asking them reflective questions so that they can get clarity around what's important to them, what their choices are, what actions they may want to take. Right. Love it. Mm -hmm. Let's shift into the, to the third question, 
which sure. to me, if I use the dragon analogy again, it's kind of like, and we've talked about this anxiety. And again, for me personally, it was this shift from how do I live an anxiety free or a dragon free world to wait a second, how do I harness this tension, mm -hmm. this dynamic tension, this mm -hmm. anxiety, so I can go towards the outcome I want. Now we've already done the work, right? We've done the, we've done the, which I think is the hardest work of really clearly defining what it is that we want, what outcome do we want. We have mm -hmm. that. Now I've got rocket fuel to, to drive passion towards baby steps. And you can't, you can't even have baby steps until you do that point. That's, I think right. that's an important thing. And, right. and the baby steps will sustain me. And maybe I don't even know how to me, right. when I say like great leaders to me, they don't know how it's going to get done. They just know it's going to get done. And that's what mm -hmm. the baby steps does mm -hmm. for me. And I, I, and I love that rubber band analogy, David, in the book, where this is the outcome. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> this is the outcome. Mm -hmm. This is me at the bottom harnessing the anxiety. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is where if, with all the counseling therapy that I've gone through, self-awareness, this describes me to a T. I've, I've had coaches tell me, Rich, you do a great job selling a vision. I get excited. I get goosebumps. You tell me. I'm like, yeah. And then the next thing I do, I'm like, well, maybe what I really want to do <laughs> is this. <laughs> and I settle. Right. And to you me, I think that is. Compromise. I compromise. Yeah. And I think that if that defines my life, that's it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and where I sit yeah. there and I'll go like that. And it's so insidious. Yeah, I've certainly reduced the tension. But I've also robbed me of some of that powerful rocket fuel to drive me towards an outcome that was probably what, what I should have you been pursuing. It. You got it. So a couple of things that you're describing that I want to connect up. So uh, I'm now going to connect up all three questions in that if I'm operating or if you're operating from that victim problem-focused orientation, again, that's going to lead to drama-filled relationships. And the third question of what actions are you taking you're merely you're going to be just reacting to the next incoming, right? Right. And um, and, um, uh, and you're going to be reacting to the anxiety that you feel, and that's what you just described. Is that if we because creating outcomes is not anxiety free, mm -hmm. and um, and that's important to know as well. And so anxiety comes with the terrain to the terrain, if you will, of creating outcomes. And the question is. Um, whether or not that anxiety has you and you're going to react to it, or if you can have the anxiety and still take the baby step to move forward. So from a creator orientation uh, or an outcome orientation, as a creator and with uh, the support of challengers and, coach, uh, and a coach around you, then it really is this, uh, what I've done is I've taken a, a model that was uh, first developed by a guy named Robert Fritz, and he called it structural or creative tension and have uh, added to that. But it's that basic idea of, I'm gonna use the rubber band, even though my cast is gonna show up, is that, that we start with what's the outcome that we want, as you said, and then we tell the truth about current reality. Mm -hmm. and, and that can uh, really take some time. And one of the things I wanna say is that, that we always, always, always start with the outcome, mm -hmm. uh, rather than, oh, I've got this problem, and right. I've got this cash flow problem, mm -hmm. Matt, to your, to your earlier mm -hmm. example. Uh, because if we start just with current reality, we will either limit what we think is possible mm -hmm. and we won't be tapping into that rocket fuel, that we won't be right. tapping into the what really matters most to us. And, you know, if if we give ourselves over to the anxiety that we feel, what you just beautifully described, Richard, is that the easiest thing we can do is to compromise the vision. Yep. Right. Is to settle for something less and see how it releases the tension. the tension that we use, that we harness to, to create outcomes, but it doesn't get us any closer to what it is that we really care about. Yep. And then the other way we can react is to not tell the truth about current reality and to shade current reality or deny, deny, minimize, et cetera. And the way to really utilize it and what the third vital question and what we call dynamic tension is all about is get as clear as possible about the vision, tell the truth about current reality, and then, um, and if you're telling the truth about current reality, the baby steps that you can take are usually readily apparent. Mm -hmm. It's like, I just, I, I need to have that conversation or I need to, to talk to this customer or I need to go uh, do this research. And, um, and it becomes an iterative process. I'm not gonna pick the, the rubber band back up, but it's an iterative process of, um, of taking it a baby step at a time. And 
And in my experience, one of three things is going to happen every time you take a baby step. It's either going to be forward progress. Uh, great. That's a, that's what I was hoping would happen. I had a great conversation, et cetera. Um, the third or second possibility is that it could be a setback or a mistake. And again, the, the part of the value of the baby step is that I've not bet the bank, so to speak. I've just taken a baby step. It's like, oh, what's to learn here? How do I adjust? And then the third possibility is that you never know when a baby step is going to be a quantum leap yeah. or a breakthrough right. that would not have happened had you not taken that step. Yep. I love that. And, mm-hmm. and, and it's so true. And you listen to all entrepreneurial stories, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, every, anybody that's created something as significant in life, they will, it was those baby steps and eventually became the breakthrough. That's right. where you always yeah. hear about, you know, the overnight sensation that took them 12 years to get right. there. <laughs> well, and, 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 right. and every company ever started that is successful started in somebody's garage, right? Exactly. That, that's what they always show us the garage, <laughs> right. right? Because they want to show you it literally started this simple or right. this, right? Mm-hmm. To your point. And, and I think that's with anything, right? It's, it's the, it's those baby steps over time that make us successful, right. not, not giant leaps or, you know, I, it's not a winning the lottery. It's a earning the lottery, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. I love well, and And another aspect of that guys is that, um, whereas uh, I, I want to be careful here because there is a place in business and, and frankly in life for, um, you know, clarity around uh, kind of longer term planning mm-hmm. sure. and planning methodologies. And this is more uh, action oriented. And, uh, and when I first started using this term baby steps, I got some feedback from uh, the company I was with at the time doing uh, leadership training. Uh, that just the concept of baby steps was sticking for people. And I was a little bit surprised because it, uh, and, and I uh, asked a couple people why that was sticky for them. And in the organization that I was a part of, there was a lot of time and energy put into long range planning and, mm-hmm. and planning, plotting out all the steps from A to Z that, that um, needed to take place. And people would get frustrated because they get the step G or whatever, and something unexpected would happen that would uh, void the the plan. And the feedback I got was what's valuable about baby steps is I don't have to have it all figured out. Mm -hmm. If I'm holding the vision and I'm telling the truth about current reality, I know what's next. Right, right. And that's what baby steps is all about. Yeah, I mean that's the that's the power behind it. And I think the myth behind detailed plan again, I'm all for planning, but it's it's like what's the intent behind the planning? Mm-hmm. Are we planning yeah. for perfection? Well then you're setting yourself up for failure if you're planning for some outcome. Again, I plan I do planning. I have an outcome in mind. It's the same thing. It's like if I'm flying a plane from here to Paris, mm-hmm. I have a detailed plan. That's pretty detailed. Sure. But I do not celebrate each individual milestone. I have it there just to know that I'm on track. Right. But I plan for all these things, for the inevitable unforeseen that could happen. And if, as long as I have my outcome in mind, I want to get all these alive people to Paris alive, right? Right. Mm-hmm. right. That affects my outcome, how I handle. I mean, it might be kind of a simple example, right? right. But I but, mean, yeah, certainly, right? Yeah. Well, but, and and you're as you're flying, you're paying attention to current reality. Exactly. And, right. and you know, if a storm, unexpected storm comes up, I mean. Uh, I'm sure that in your planning and your flight plan, you you think you know what the weather is going to be, but I'm sure yeah. that there are things that happen in flight. It's like, oh, I now need to take a little bit different tack, or I need to change uh, the the way I was going to approach this because you're paying attention to the current conditions and current reality. Right. The detailed flight plan I have, every one is, is my plan is essentially air quotes useless. It's not really useless, but it's if if I was gauging success at hitting each of those mile points at a certain time. That's not the point. My point is like, oh, I can divert. Right. I know how much my reach. I am ahead on gas. I have options. I know what to do now because of this yeah. unexpected thunderstorm. Or this person in the back is having a heart attack. Hey, we can't go to Paris. Where can we go? Right? Yeah. So, yeah. I love the story or the analogy in the book, um, Three Vital Questions, of, of building the fence. I think where it puts it all together, right? Where the, the, the couple went through the, the iteration. And it reminds me, because even I've used this example when I've talked about three vital questions to people in tying it together, I have, and it's similar to your story in your book, it's like I have in my house, and I'm reminded constantly by either my wife or me visibly walking through the house, 15 things that need to be fixed mm-hmm. or that I want fixed. 
I never tackle them because I can't do all 15 at once because I don't have the cash to do it on hand. I want to keep my savings at a certain level. I get kind of panicky mm-hmm. if my savings get at this level. And so I don't fix the fence or I don't pour the new driveway until my wife explains to me again, when are we going to fix the stupid driveway <laughs> or right. whatever? And I do the things, going back to the first one, is like I see the cracks in the driveway. I immediately go to how much this is going to cost, how much my savings are going to be depleted. I get anxiety. I go watch Netflix or play PlayStation and forget <laughs> about it, right? So, right. But if I take – if I harness that and sit mm-hmm. down there and talk with my wife, okay, look, we got this 15 list. We love this house. We want to do mm-hmm. with it. What's most important to us? Well, the driveway. Why is the driveway important to us? Well, because it's going to mean this. We won't have to do this. We can do that. We can have barbecues. The kids can play basketball. We can rollerblade. We do whatever. And now I've yeah. I've created this outcome. Right. And it's given mm-hmm. me fuel. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm still worried. This is the key point. The anxiety hasn't necessarily gone away. Right. I'm right. still worried about how much it's going to cost. But now I've got buying. I've, I've, I've seen the passion of my wife, what's mm-hmm. important to her. I've got rocket fuel. Mm-hmm. I, I'm happy, mm-hmm. too. I agree with it. Now I take a baby step and I call contractors. I get three out there. Three come out. I get three bids. And, oh, by the way, the third bid, the guy tells me, hey, you know what? I can do 18 months, no interest. Now it doesn't become a savings problem. It becomes a cash flow problem mm-hmm. that's manageable for me. That's a breakthrough. That's how I kind of describe it, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, a baby step that is a quantum leap. Right. right. Yeah. And yeah. I wouldn't have got there. Yeah. I would have got there mm-hmm. if I hadn't harnessed that dynamic tension. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To find the outcome and took a baby step to call a contractor. That's to me. That's even, uh, yeah. Uh, even though you were feeling anxiety, it, I so still right. yeah. forward in the face of anxiety. You have the anxiety, but the anxiety doesn't have you and cause you to go reactive. That's the key. Yeah. Yeah. I love this book, David. I just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's awesome. just been transformative yeah. for me, and I think it's just great stuff. I, I think there's so many leadership books out there in a sea, as we all know. We can go Google Amazon right now mm-hmm. and see all the hundreds of leadership books that are coming out in 20, the rest of 2021. And what I love about this, David, is that it's not Pollyannish. I think a lot of times I read these leadership books that come down the pike and they're, they're like, if you do this, it's going to be – look, there's nothing new under the sun. And you are tapping into, I think, the natural laws of leadership that just exist that nobody invented. They just are. And if we, and if we harness them and we, and we take hold of them and realize that this is a lifelong journey like you pointed out, you got to be forgiving of yourself – you got to be forgiving of others. Start seeing people as creators. It's it taps into everything, David. Empathy, emotional quotient. It taps into being composed in a chaotic situation. At a choice. It's a. I just love it. I just, I just love you. all of this. Yes. I appreciate that very much. I don't know what, what did we talk? Did we hit everything? Is there anything that we didn't talk about? I know we're coming up on an hour here. Did we, is there anything we didn't talk about that 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 Matt or David that we want to get across? No, I, I'm, I think it was great. I'm, I'm feeling good. It's been a great conversation. It's yeah. been a great conversation. I, th- there is one other thing I want to mm-hmm. say. Yes, please. And, and that actually is going to circle back to, um, again, getting maybe nitpicky around language, but something that you said uh, at the top of our conversation, Richard, about um, really getting that, that drama is uh, is part of our humanness, and it is part of our humanness. What I want to say, though, that, uh, and this is what, uh, it's not nitpicky, I think it's a very important point, is I truly believe that as, that as human beings, that our true essence is a creator essence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that the, the, the drama roles are roles that we play and roles that we fall into when we are reacting and when we're in that that mindset, but the rea- but the reality is, I really firmly believe in our essence. We are creators, and we have that capacity for envisioning outcomes, for choosing our response to what it is that we uh, are are dealt with in life, and that we can uh, collaborate and co-create uh, with others and with our life experience as challengers and coaches. Agree 100%. I think it's a great, subtle, but very powerful point, right? And I will definitely use that in the future as I'm describing because I'm with you. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the great mm-hmm. coaches, the great leaders. It's how you view people, right? Do you view them as, as I see you, even though you're yelling at me and throwing spears at me and they're actually kind of hurting, 
I can still choose to look at you as a creator. And I think that is the power behind it, mm -hmm. right? Particularly right, yeah. in those stressful situations, an irate customer, an argument mm -hmm. with a spouse, mm -hmm. a disagreement with your kid, whatever. Mm -hmm. You can become empathetic no matter, in that way, no matter what comes your way. And, they, and those arrows don't necessarily penetrate. They start to deflect, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's the power behind it. I love, I love that you pointed that out, David, because you're absolutely right. Appreciate it. Great conversation. How can people connect with you, David, and learn more about your stuff? Um, two, two websites. One is uh, Three Vital Questions, and that's the nu numeral three. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, threevitalquestions.com. And then related to the uh, earlier book, which is uh, really about, uh, to me, Three Vital Questions is about uh, organizational leadership and that we're all leaders in organizations. And, and uh, whereas The Power of Ted and the website for the power of Ted is powerofted.com. Uh, and that the Ted really is about self leadership, how we lead our own lives. Uh, and the, the two are, uh, are very intertwined. But um, so we've got those two websites. Awesome. David? Yep. Yes. Thanks Incredible. for coming yeah, on the show. Matt, Matt, any last words? No, I'm just so appreciative. Um, you know, I, I loved your work. It's an honor to be able to spend time with you today and visit about your work. It's certainly impacted my life and the lives of the people around me because I either am interacting with them in a better, healthier way, or I'm even helping them understand how to interact with themselves in a better, better healthier way. So it's kind of like that, uh, that pebble in the pond, your, your ripple has washed this way and is continuing. So we'll keep that ripple moving forward. Thank Amen. you, my friend. Uh, Matt, Richard, it's been great to, uh, to just to have this chat with you. And um, and I'll say goodbye by uh, just saying how I say goodbye to everybody, which is here's to the creator and you. Awesome. Thanks, great. David. Thanks awesome. for coming on the show. Thank you. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the Next Level Method podcast. If you found some value in this, tell somebody about the show. Tell your friends, tell your spouse, tell your kids. Let them know all about Next Level Method. Go to nextlevelmethod.com to learn more and join our community. Thanks for tuning in.